All right, practice indie. Today is like, I feel kind of like a famous, but like famous by association because on the podcast today, we have Rachel Casey, who is one of our members, but is also a, a boss in the universe. And uh, we're going to be talking specifically about the coronavirus and also about breath capacity. She works with the Asthma Coalition. Um, so just like, you know, she just knows all the things and is really quite impressive. So, um, so really, I just want her to talk for the next 15 to 20 minutes and me to sit and bask in her glow. Uh, Rachel, thank you for being here. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, your background, all that? Yeah, for sure. I, I appreciate that glowing recommendation. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so so my name's Rachel, and um, I am currently a full-time director at Indiana CTSI, um, and I am a uh, director of a statewide chronic disease coalition uh, that covers the whole state of Indiana, and the coalition focuses mostly on chronic disease of respiratory, so asthma, COPD, um, but we also cover topics of environmental health, healthy housing and homes, and um, clean air. So a little bit of everything there. Um, I also do some research for the university and public policy and public health and also contract with the Indiana State Department of Health, especially with COVID uh, happening. I have a pretty heavy disease investigation background. And so when COVID came to Indiana and we started um, essentially an investigation, I was one of those individuals on that team and have working uh, with the COVID investigation uh, since March. So I have a lot of hats that I wear. <laughs> and I do yoga. <laughs> and you do yoga in your, in your, you know, air quotes, spare time. <laughs> For when sure. we actually met um, for coffee, I guess it was like tail end of February, early March, right when COVID was really hitting in um, Indiana, and we were at Quills, and they were already like, you know, scrubbing the tables with bleach. I remember thinking like, I remember thinking like, wow, what it would be like to be you right now, like as you're watching probably stuff that goes unseen all the time to the I call it gen pop or the lay person that like, you're probably knowing like what's coming or like, wow, we should have been doing this forever or anything like that. So I was, I was very struck in that moment by just the, uh, the oddity of it all. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the, so we had the privilege of working with you on some videos and some content about um, just, you know, building your breath capacity through yogic techniques, through pranayama. Can you talk a little bit about the intersectionality of chronic respiratory disease and COVID and what that, maybe what the risks are, what you're seeing in particular with that intersection? Yeah, definitely. And so um, with COVID is a particularly interesting virus uh, because it does affect uh, individuals who do already have uh, a chronic disease, uh, not just um, asthma or respiratory, but also diabetes uh, and cancer are just a few. And so people with uh, moderate to severe asthma uh, may be at higher risk of getting sick from COVID, um, and it can definitely affect their respiratory tracts of so things like their nose, throat, lungs definitely onsets an asthma attack. And for a lot of people um, can lead to pneumonia and acute respiratory disease. So it's really important that, you know, folks that have asthma or they have any kind of breathing problems um, that they do some precautionary things to keep themselves healthy, especially if they do end up getting COVID. And some of those just include, you know, quitting smoking or vaping, if that is something that you do, uh, taking their medication as as prescribed by their doctor and as directed, and then making sure they follow with their asthma action plans on hand just in case they do have any kind of um, exasperation or distress from not being able to breathe. So for, for those elements, especially for folks that you know do have some issues with breathing, um, they're not so much at a higher risk, but if they do have COVID, it definitely could have a bit more harsher symptoms and lead you probably a bit more to be hospitalized because of that. Okay. What do you, um, I'm sure 
all, I'm sure like everyone has a billion questions for you and you probably see lots of lots of things on the social media. If if there was like a myth you could debunk about COVID, what would it be? And what is the best thing that people can do for themselves? Um, you know, regardless of having a chronic health issue, what what is something in general that people can be doing to stay safe and healthy through the, the pandemic? Yeah, so um, I probably, I do get asked a lot about the effectiveness of wearing a mask. I know a mask is kind of a big topic for a lot of people. Um, we're in summer months, it's hot, it's mm -hmm. uncomfortable to especially to have to wear it for long periods of time. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of, um, a lot of people aren't entirely convinced, I would say, that, you know, a, a mask is protective or it does anything of value. And so, you know, lately, especially if you go out um, in public, you've been seeing probably a lot of people not wearing them. <laughs> so <laughs> what, one of the things I would suggest is that, you know, a mask is actually pretty important and it's probably, it's more important than the reason that you think it is. And that being is that wearing a mask um, doesn't protect you from acquiring COVID or other viruses. Um, that's going to happen pretty prevalently, even without a mask. Um, but when you do have, um, say, COVID and you're not showing any symptoms, which ends up being about 45% of all cases. So almost half of the people that we know have had COVID have had no symptoms. So if you're not feeling sick, you're probably gonna be out, you're probably gonna be out socializing and going out in public. And so when you wear a mask in public and you're sick and you don't know that you're sick, you are essentially protecting those around you. So by wearing a mask, you are essentially keeping all of that bodily fluid <laughs> to your <laughs> and, and we do a dispel droplets, you know, when we cough, when we sneeze, even when we talk, um, they're just very small. And so when you're sitting next to somebody you're talking, you are dispelling <laughs> essentially saliva and droplets. And so that's why it's really important that, you know, masks are essential because you are essentially cutting off that ability for a virus to be suspended um, and land on a surface or in the air. So as far as protecting yourself, masks are very important, um, not touching your face, practicing social distancing, um, and making sure that you kind of just disinfect and clean surfaces that you might share uh, with other people. So definitely like a household um, kind of situation and kind of just be cognizant of, you know, where you're putting your, your hands and, and the things that you're touching and just making sure that you're washing your hands consistently. Thank you. Um, that actually does for me, I mean, I've been wearing masks and, and thinking that it kind of works two ways. It protects me and it, I, and it protects others, but it's really helpful to know, like, it mainly is a, a barrier so I don't infect others, which I had, I had not understood that. So thank you. Um, how do you feel putting on the spot a bit and you can be like, well, I don't want to fucking answer that. Um, <laughs> how do you feel about, since we've required masks, especially at yoga, I think it's been important in that setting because we are actively breathing and we are like, you know, we are telling people to exhale with force and inhale with force. How do you feel? I know you've come back to a couple of classes. Like, how do you feel with that process of wearing a mask and practicing? Yeah, so it's it's definitely been a challenge for me, at least. Um, I, I'm like an overheater when I exercise. <laughs> So any movement that I do, I'm already like sweating and I'm already very hot and um, it's a bit challenging for me to breathe. I don't have asthma, but I, I do just have a shorter span of breath. And so I tend to kind of huff and puff even in a normal day of yoga. And so having a mask on has definitely been an adjustment and a challenge, but I do think it's important. Um, that we remain when we go to, you know, a yoga studio. Um, I think the studio does a really great job of, you know, social distancing and allowing that space for folks. But definitely, um, I know I'm huffing and puffing by the end of an hour session. <laughs> <So> <laughs> that is definitely going, you know, to the places around me, possibly on me, you know, depending on where we're at in the room. And so it is, I do think it's important um, to still just be cognizant of that um, and to, to wear a mask um, 
And again, I guess the important thing to know is this isn't a permanent situation. I know it's very daunting. It's um, very new to all of us. Uh, and it's never, it's not going to be this way forever. Um, so it is temporary, um, but it is important that we, we still continue uh, having some protection uh, to limit the amount of people that might uh, get COVID. Yeah, I think that is so critical to mention because I, I hear a lot of people saying like, well, this is going to be like 9-11 where everything has changed forever. And it's like, yes, like that, that is true, but that, that is true of every passing day. You know, every, <laughs> we're, we're constantly changing, but I don't think it's changing in the way that we will forever wear masks. And even, um, even last year, my husband and I traveled to China and they do wear masks in the subway system and in places where there are high contact because, you know, the population density is so much different, but they don't wear them when they're walking on the street and they don't, you know, like there's a way of life that they've accustomed to wearing masks. And then, um, yeah, I think people have to wrap their minds around that this is temporary and yes, it will change things, but it's not going to be this intense forever. This is a moment in time that will pass. So I appreciate you saying that. Um, what is the current status of the virus in Indiana? And like, what is, what is the progression look like? What do you, how do you, are you feeling about a second wave in the fall? Yeah, so um, as far as progression, Indiana is, I would say, a bit ahead of the curve, which is really nice um, because though we did have a lot of reported cases in the beginning, March and April, it does uh, seem to show evidence that the virus has slowed its spread within the state. Um, and that's really because of a recent um, scientific study um, that the Richard Fairbanks School of Public Health and the Indiana State Department of Health have conducted, in which they essentially reached out to many people across the state and asked them to perform testing. And out of those test results, we did see more people with antibodies of COVID than active infections. And so what that means is that there have been more people who have had COVID and already recovered versus have COVID right now currently. Mm -hmm. uh, so that just shows that there was a spread that happened you know, pretty invasively, probably March, April. Um, but again, since a lot of cases don't have symptoms, people didn't know that they were sick. And so it, you know, just didn't dawn on them. And so uh, with this study, um, which is really great because it's a national recognized study too, um, so go Indiana, that we do have um, a really a good system in place where we're not seeing super high rates of infection. And there seem to be <clears throat> slowing down, but still there are infections happening. So right now, as of yesterday, there's a little over 43,000 uh, confirmed cases of COVID, and there have been almost 2,500 reported deaths. So it is still a lot to consider because that's still a lot of people um, that is, you know, for preventable deaths we, um, to kind of focus on. I think the other point to mention is that um, we have noticed that there is um, a discrepancy um, and a huge disparity among the minority communities about the rates of infections uh, for certain groups. And we do see much higher rates in the African-American community specifically um, compared to uh, other uh, groups. And so one of the really great things that the governor um, has done is created a task force um, assigned to essentially trying to figure out why this disparity exists and try to come up with a solution by the end of June of what they can implement to try to reduce this uh, disparity as well as trying to figure out a plan um, to address the rising infection rate in some of the state prison systems. So uh, there's been a lot of really great work that public health um, officials have done here uh, in Indiana, but there's definitely still some, some more work to go. I do wanna give a shout out to you, know, you and to anyone who works in the public health sphere because I traveled home to Alabama to see my parents and there was a stark difference in how we are managing wearing masks and um, taking this seriously versus some of the states I passed through to get to Alabama. So I am uh, super grateful for everyone's work and really proud of our state because um, I do see the difference and like physically saw the difference as I was traveling. Um, and I think what you brought up about the minority 
population is so important. One of my best friends is a physician in New York and uh, specifically she works in geriatric medicine. And, you know, at the very beginning of this thing, she just said, like, if you don't believe racism exists, then go into the hospitals right now and see who's dying of COVID. And that just like shook me to the core. Um, and I think, you know, my own personal note to those listening is that the why we wear masks, especially when you're going into a grocery store. And if, you know, if your grocery store is staffed or is, um, you know, if their patrons are mainly people of color, wearing a mask is not about you. It's about, you know, protecting those populations that are already affected significantly more than white people. So I appreciate you saying that. And yeah, I think it's really important that we keep perspective on the mask wearing too, that it, it goes beyond our, our sm small spheres of influence. Um, you know, this is a very, <laughs> LOL, this is a very stressful time. Like, <laughs> uh, I've been very stressed out. It's been incredibly hard. I don't think I'm alone in that. And so I'm just wondering how you as an individual, how have you been feeling in this? And how are you managing your stress, fear, anxiety, or whatever emotions you have associated with it? Yeah, so kind of like I mentioned before, um, a good a good idea to just hold on to is that this is a temporary situation. Things will get better. Um, it has been hard, so I, <laughs> I don't want to give like a very simple, easy answer of yes, you know, just manage your stress and you'll be fine because um, I'm very fortunate that I have a job that allows me to work from home full time. Uh, I'm very fortunate that I have a nice apartment that I can spend a lot of time in and um, still have income and, and not have a lot of the worries that I know some of my friends, colleagues, and families have uh, that have families that are struggling, whether it's losing their job, um, financially not being able to pay their bills. And so uh, there is a reasonable uh, amount of, of stress and fear and anxiety about what how long is this going to continue is you know the impacts of this are going to be felt for a very long time so i don't want to minimalize um, anyone's troubles or stress or fear because um, there are a lot of people that are really struggling right now but i do think that for me personally um you know some days are great i get to spend a lot of time with my dog my dog's going to be so sad when i have to go back to work <laughs> She's the highlight of my Zoom meetings. Everyone just cheers when she's in the back. So it, it's been really nice. Um, and I, I do like to spend time at home. I have a really nice porch and I like to work on. Um, but there's other days where it's been stressful. Um, you know, I live with a partner in a small apartment and we both work full time. So just kind of being on top of each other, not being able to go out really frequently. Um, so it's, it's normal. It's normal if you're having days where you just want to rip your hair out and just say why. And it's normal to have days where you're kind of just very positive and still outlooking the fact that, you know, today you got to reach out to somebody you hadn't talked to in a while, even if it was just to Zoom or to give them a phone call. Um, yoga obviously has been really helpful for de-stressing me in between the jobs that I'm doing, um, even the sessions that are on Zoom, um, so I can kind of do them at my own leisure, um, as well as, you know, reconnecting with um, friends and family. A lot of my family lives in New Jersey, so um, it's given me that time that I always would say I don't have time to do, uh, to now be at home and to make those phone calls and to connect with old friends and, and to kind of just make sure and check in that they're doing. So it's, it's a bit of just management of what works best for you, but trying to stay in a positive mindset, um, I think is probably the most important, uh, important aspect of coping. Yeah, I will, I will say to our summer school group, our, ch our month challenge right now, we're doing uh, meditation. And so I've moved back to a silent meditation practice daily. And while it feels insufferable for 10 minutes to sit with myself, it's been quite the like mental boot camp to be able to sit with exactly what you're saying, the impermanent or the, yeah, the impermanence of it all and the permanence of it all and where we meet in the middle of the constant change and then what will be, what will be left over, you know, because this will have and has had economic, major economic 
repercussions for so many people. Um, but then we also get to build a new reality. And again, to echo you, I don't want to minimize the struggle that many have had, but hopefully this, you know, gets people washing their hands more and <laughs> flu season won't be as rough because we're actually taking those kinds of things seriously. Whereas in years past, maybe we didn't have a reason to be as diligent. So um, yeah, I think meditation, yoga, I've been gardening a shit ton. I feel like we're going to have more food in this city than we know what to do with because all the urban gardeners have just taken to their yards. So very cool. Um, well, kind of, I guess, last question is just, are there any resources you would recommend for people to check out through all this? I know you, you do specific work with um, upper respiratory chronic illness. Is there anything about breathing? It's a, such an interesting time um, that our lungs and respiration has been brought up so much with kind of the echo of George Floyd, I can't breathe and COVID-19 being a disease, an upper respiratory disease. And, you know, I, 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 I am a hippie, so I find no coincidence in that, that we are talking a lot about our inability to breathe, even wearing a mask, while it's obviously the best choice, makes it hard to breathe. So maybe what resources do you have to share with people? And, and, and if there's anything to say about the breath connection, I'd be super interested in that. Yeah, for sure. So, so to start um, with the deep breathing um, and kind of how that impacts your overall health, um, we are human beings and we often do forget the importance and the wonder of breathing. And so deep breathing brings us back into that space because it allows us to essentially lower stress in the body when we focus on our breath. Um, so when you breathe deeply, it does send messages to your brain to calm down, and then the brain sends these messages back to your body. So when that happens, when you take deep breaths and you meditate, even if it's just for a couple minutes, um, that affects your physical body, um, such as you know slowing your heart rate, um, slowing your breathing, lowering your blood pressure. They all have really positive effects on the body, and so you know, whether it's yoga, meditation, even if it's five minutes of breathing exercises, especially for folks that might have asthma or any other kind of respiratory illness, um, it really does have an impact on your overall health by simply just working on some uh, deep breathing techniques. As far as kind of sort uh, resources, um, as in just general, and I've been kind of, because I work in community health, have been reaching out and just providing these um, is, you know, things like to other ways to manage your stress would be to stay focused and relax and rest. So I'm one of those people, I have to do something every minute of every day, but sometimes <laughs> we need to relax and just rest. Um, and just to make sure that you, um, you stay informed. I know that there's a lot of information floating around right now. So just make sure if you're, you're kind of getting information, it's uh, from credible sources um, or from local updates. You know, try to avoid just things you read on social media because a lot of times that might not come from a best credible source. Um, another great way is to kind of reconnect with friends, families, and your local community. So making sure you're just aware of the resources, the mental health resources and medical resources in your community, um, attending meetings to share those resources, um, you know, sharing news that you know is, is, is good and positive, but also um, confirm to avoid kind of creating any kind of unnecessary fear or panic. Um, and this is one's really important for parents because you really do want to give age appropriate information to children and to remember to stay calm because children often feel what you feel. So making sure that you, you have a calm demeanor and you're confident um, is really important. Um, and then of course, just reaching out to people who you know might be you know, affected by, by this, particularly senior citizens. Um, I had a call with somebody a couple days ago where it's really nice that the state's reopening. A lot of people are, are getting the opportunity to go out, but even if you look at the recommended guidelines or the opening stages for Indiana at every level, it does recommend that 
you know, senior citizens or older adults and those with these chronic conditions still remain inside. And so that in itself is, is a bit isolating. Um, so making sure that if you know somebody that, you know, doesn't have the luxury or pleasure right now of, of being able to get outside, that you check in on them, that you try to, you know, maybe visit or, or tr try to see if you can connect with them in some way, even if it's just a call. Um, and just be sensitive um, to anybody that you know might have a confirmed COVID test because um, disease <laughs> is very interesting, but it does not discriminate. And so um, somebody who has COVID is, is not because of how much money they make or the way that they look or where their families come from. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're avoiding any kind of false rumors or negative stereotypes. Um, and of course, if you, um, if you do feel like you are having a mental health crisis to always go and seek professional help um, if you're having difficulty coping. I'm gonna to try to pull this up as we speak, but I might have to uh, put it in the show notes, but the, there's an Indiana wellness, <clears throat> uh, health, mental health wellness committee that put up a website. I'll put, the, I'll put it in the show notes, but um, uh, one of the, oh my gosh, no, I'm blinking, but um, anyway, it's a wonderful resource if you perhaps, you know, like me, I don't have traditional insurance, so to get mental health help, um, I don't, you know, I have to go through alternative sources and it gives resources for uh, anyone that's in my situation or, you know, if you have, if you have insurance, it's actually surprisingly more challenging to find a therapist than I realized just because they're, <laughs> they're working overtime right now. So um, I'll put that in the show notes, but I just pre appreciate you so much. Uh, what you last said too, I'm a huge history nerd and uh, Typhoid Mary is something I've, someone I've been reading a lot about. She was basically, I'm sure you've heard about her, but pinpointed as one of the like uh, vectors of typhoid and they put her on this island and shunned her, you know, for the rest of her life. And so I think there is this um, energy around viruses that then we kind of other people because they got sick and, you know, remembering like what you, the statistic you gave earlier, 45% of people are asymptomatic. So getting, you know, getting the virus is something you might even not know is coming your way um, two weeks in too. So Oh, it's a fascinating time to be alive. Um, I cannot thank you enough for your time. As I know you have, you do wear a lot of hats. You do so much good in the world. And I just, uh, I want to say thank you for being as who you are and how you show up. And thank you for being a yoga practitioner and, and specifically a practice indie and, and just in general, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for, for having me on your podcast today. And, um, I love the studio. I think it's a really great community space and I look forward to continuing my practice uh, at the studio. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Rachel.